Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of our interview series of ACEs on Impact of Science. I am here with Oliver Cox, who I've been working with for, I think, a year and a half now, uh, and it's been always wonderful, and I'm very happy that he is here. He is uh, the co-lead of the Oxford University Heritage Network, um, helping Oxford engagements with, with the UK uh, on the heritage community. So um, he's going to tell much more about that. Uh, Oliver, welcome. I'm very happy to have you here. Thanks, Annika. Lovely to be here. And um, I, I was wondering, because you can do that much better than I can, but can you quickly introduce yourself? What do you do? What's your position in the, the science ecosystem in the UK and outside? Yeah, well, thanks ever so much for the opportunity to, to share the work that we do with you and, um, and, and the audience today. So in my role at the University of Oxford, I'm uh, co-lead, as you said, of the Oxford University Heritage Network and also Heritage Engagement Fellow. And the second of those job titles is probably a bit more helpful in terms of giving an insight as to what I actually do. Um, what we identified about eight years ago now was a gap between uh, research being conducted into and about heritage. So what I mean by heritage is uh, everything that society values from the past that they would like to take forward into the present and the future. So that could be everything from intangible folk traditions through to buildings, paintings, artifacts, sculpture, and the whole gamut we're, we're, we're interested in. Um, and it seemed to us that there was a real gap between research on the one hand and the UK, wider UK and international heritage sector on the other. And it's worth saying that the, the heritage sector is a, is a hugely important part of both the UK, European and global economy. It accounts for, you know, uh, a very significant number of international uh, tourism. What will happen to that uh, after the current pandemic has closed? We're, we're not quite sure. Um, but anyway, it seemed like there was a market opportunity and it seemed like what was lacking were individuals and um, sort of networks that could bring together those two sides to find projects that had mutual benefit at their core. So my team that works in the humanities division at the University of Oxford, there are three core principles to our work. The first is around building partnerships. It's about investing in the time to go out from the university and meet other organizations in their, you know, at their venues, in their in coffee shops. I mean, now obviously we do it all online and listen and try and understand what are the big challenges, what are the big problems, what are the big questions that those organizations or indeed individuals might have. And then take those conversations back into a university context to find who on our side might be interested in helping, uh, you know, helping find a solution to those particular challenges. So that's the building partnerships aspect. The second, if you like, pillar of our research, our work, sorry, uh, we call it um, growing expertise. So we're really interested in the ways in which collaborative working outside of a university context with non-university partners can help our researchers develop a wide range of skills that ultimately, when we're talking about PhD students, will make them more employable in different marketplaces, not just as uh, academics. We like to think that it also helps competitiveness when applying for academic jobs, but it also gives a wider field of vision that enables our students to go on to do a whole host of different things. So in order to grow that expertise, we run a series of training events that focus on the skills, language and connections and networks that you need to be successful in the heritage sector. And then third and finally, we're really interested in our, our third principle, which we call sharing knowledge. So how do we ensure that through building those partnerships, growing that expertise, that any project outcome is shared with as wide a range of people as possible? So on the humanities research side, this often comes down to narrative, to storytelling. 
how do we ensure that great new archival research that may have been conducted by one of our researchers um, can be shared with um, non-specialist audiences, but also specialist audiences. So how do we make sure that there's the peer reviewed journal article on the one hand, perhaps a pithy engaging blog post or Instagram post on the other. And if we're working with an organization that has a public face and has a visitor business, that there is something tangible that people can go and see and engage with. So that's a headline summary of what the Heritage Partnerships team does. No, that's fantastic. What, what I'm wondering, um, Ollie, just a little bit more about, about you, um, perhaps your own history, heritage. How did you get to this, this, this point, the, the, the connecting uh, uh, the research with, with, with business parts, uh, especially for humanities? How did, you, how did you come to this yourself, maybe? So my, my sort of background into, into coming into this role, um, I went to Oxford as an undergraduate. I did a master's at Oxford and I did a funded PhD, so funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council. And towards the end of that PhD, it became clear that I didn't want to be an academic, um, but I really enjoyed working in a university context and in a context where knowledge uh, is valued, is prized and also you know, there's an ambition to share that, that insight and expertise more, more widely. Um, so having had a series of failed attempts when I was uh, as an undergraduate and master's student uh, at getting jobs working in the corporate world, I tried to be a management consultant, I was crap at that, I tried to be a venture capitalist, I was awful at that. It became clear that actually the thing that really did motivate me was, was you know, historical research that connected with people. And I think that the light bulb moment for me was in the second year of my PhD, I discovered a set of letters some archival material that shed light on the first performance of a, uh, a hugely significant song in British national identity, Rule Britannia. And what I was able to do through these uh, letters was suggest that the original meaning of the song is very, very different to that which we have come to understand it today. Um, I wrote a press release and it got me on the TV. I did loads of stuff on radio. It was in lots of, you know, lots of newspapers. And what was really exciting about that for me was that it, 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 it opened my eyes to the idea that Ultimately, there are a whole range of different organizations, individuals, and, 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 and you know, non-specialists that are interested in really brilliant content. And my academic colleagues would hate me for saying that the work that we do is to be a content provider. But in its essence, that, that's what we're doing. We, we you know, discover, research, uncover great new content that we can share with different people. So with that kind of inspiration in mind, I looked for precedent and, 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 and ideas and examples of how this had been done in the past um, and found an organization called the Yorkshire Country House Partnership set up by the University of New York in the north of England. And for the, la the previous 10 years, so between 2007, uh, 2003 and 2013 by this point, they had been working to bring together curators uh, academics, museum professionals, and sort of audience, you know, front of house people at country houses to develop projects that would bring more people to these properties and enable, you know, greater commercial sustainability for the organizations on the one hand, and the opportunity to do great new research projects uh, for academics on the other. Um, and so being completely shameless, I rang up the guy that founded it and asked if he could advise me how to do the same thing in Oxford, which he did. Um, Christopher Ridgway, who was the curator at Castle Howard, um, better known now as Clifton Castle, the home of Simon, Duke of Hastings in Bridgerton. Um, uh, so we worked together. And I think a really interesting lesson for me was having that kind of mentor or someone that has been through it before that's willing to invest in someone that is perhaps, you know, is a generation younger than them, 
but wants to kind of continue their ideas and maybe apply them in a different way was was hugely important in getting it set up because also the the University of Oxford who came in and invested in a one-year post to enable me to trial this they could see that there was a precedent and they could see that that precedent uh, had resulted in increased grant capture for the University of York but also you know increased um, public engagement opportunities, knowledge exchange opportunities. And, you know, in terms of the direction in which universities, certainly in the UK, were traveling uh, 10 years ago, this was all very new, but very exciting. And the kind of space and place that the university wanted, the University of Oxford wanted to inhabit. So I, if you like, offered them a pilot opportunity. And that's, that's sort of how it started. No, that's great. And, and what's interesting about that is also your own experience having, uh, uh, you know, that text, that British text, and 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 actually only by yourself, without the 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 the, the facilities around you, having gotten all that attention in TV. And uh, but obviously, for a lot of researchers, it it won't go that way. They might actually really need that support and and uh, facilities. So so how do you feel about because uh, you've set up. A certain structure yourself um, when it comes to building an infrastructure, structural collaboration, something that helps um, researchers, especially especially in the humanities or the social sciences, to um, develop themselves or be able to have their programs uh, be be used in, uh, in in society. How would you describe what, what what are the priorities in that? What are the first things that they would need? A, a brilliant question and I think the first the most important thing is a is a is a shared value system rooted on mutual respect and I think one of the big challenges around the way in which some of these structures in the you know in universities are created is that there is a hierarchy between academics who are seen as better more important more significant than the research support staff or enablers that sit around academics. I think it's 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 far better to think about this in a you know in a in a much more commercial context, which is that any good business doesn't employ the same type of people. You know, you need to have a diversity of skills, a diversity of experience, and a diversity of perspective in order to be able to create something truly exciting and truly innovative. So to my mind, I think one of the one of the most important things about building that kind of infrastructure is you know, a shared investment in why are we doing this? You know, and so for my team, why are we doing this? It's because we believe in the value of the past. We believe in the value of heritage sites in building a more equitable and a more inclusive society today and into the future. So that's, you know, at a macro level, that's why we do what we do. At a, at a micro level, that translates to knowing that if we need to get projects off the ground, we are going to need a mixture of probably historical expertise. We'll need someone that is very good at project management. And, you know, not all academics are great at project management. Um, there are brilliant professionals that can help and support that. So I, I think... For me, the, the key thing is recognizing that you need different types of specialism and that each of those types of specialism has to be held at the same level of high regard, if you like. I, I, I hate hierarchies. It's something that really, I, I really can't bear them because I think they really inhibit great work. Um, so, so for me, I think the key to building that supportive structure is both that mutual respect, but also from the researcher side, there's a little bit of humility that we need as well, which is that if we are working with public engagement professionals who know their audiences, who know how to connect with, with, with people, um, that if they're suggesting that maybe that label text or that, you know, that caption that you've written for an exhibition being 500 words long in size 10 font might not work, then we need to empower our, our academics to understand that there's a different level of expertise that comes to bear on that, that can help actually communicate the message out, out better. So that's my real 
feeling is that in order for this work to continue to thrive within universities, it's about recruiting, also recruiting people from outside of a university context, people with commercial backgrounds or, or sort of charitable or third sector backgrounds that have different ways of working. And I think out of that, there can be quite a productive, you know, I was going to say productive tension, but also just a, a, a kind of productive exchange of views as to how one might do something um, and so for me when I'm when I'm sort of creating project teams to help answer particular questions I think the most important thing is to create a kind of bespoke configuration of expertise that helps push forward say the client's agenda but at the same time we know is bringing back knowledge and sort of insight to um, you know to our institution. With all the projects, uh, Oliver, that you've worked with, are there, and I know you can't choose favorites, you can also choose something from, from outside. I'm just curious, um, uh, what are, do you have examples of maybe uh, people you've worked with, uh, research programs getting out there, uh, the, the project teams you got together with, with, with an actual impact in the end that you think that's, that is an excellent example of perhaps people who were maybe you know, a little reluctant or not understanding or, or, and then you brought together different talents and skills in a team and they actually managed to get an amazing uh, product out there from academic, from science? I, I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's one example in particular that, that, that really sticks in my mind because it was a, a bit of an early success. Um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, look back on it fondly. Um, there is a, Tudor, so a 16th century country house called the Vine, which is in southeast England. And there was a major conservation issue. Essentially, the roof was falling off. Um, so it required significant structural intervention. Um, it is owned by Europe's largest conservation charity, the National Trust for England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And so my team was approached by the National Trust to ask how we might be able to help and what was wonderful about this project is that it, it opened up two distinct avenues of collaboration um, that became mutually reinforcing on the one hand there was a, a sort of if you like a, a histories angle to it which is that in order to enable the roof work to happen the historic collection in the house was largely decanted or sort of moved out and, and, and sort of, you know, got out so it was safe for the, the work to carry to, to, to happen. This opened up a large part of the house for the first time, no collections in there, the opportunity to put in a new, a temporary exhibition space to share the stories of that particular, uh, of that particular property. We worked really closely with the National Trust team and the third party in all of this were a creative, uh, a kind of creative industries firm of exhibition designers who were brilliant because they they thought about things in a completely different but really inspiring way they were hugely visual in the way that uh, in contrast to our team which were very textual and the national trust property team who really understood their how visitors might behave so what was very exciting was having that 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 sort of combination of different talents to answer one question um, so if that was going on inside colleagues who are experts in heritage science so trying to understand how material types might change over time and how you best conserve them to ensure the building remains um, you know structurally sound into the future and perhaps less vulnerable to uh, extremes of weather, which we're experiencing in, in the UK because of the consequences of climate change. Um, you know, they were doing great stuff, you know, great, like kind of, yeah, really scientific stuff up, up in the roof, along with a really lovely little public engagement piece of work that they were doing outside. And so for me, what was so ex exciting about that was, you know, We'd gone through the whole journey right from the beginning before the work had started. We'd scoped it out in an adventurous and an inclusive and an ambitious way, delivered the project. And it was seeing visitors who had no idea about the backstory of how all of this had happened, you know, really enjoying it. That was the moment where you thought, actually, this is really worth it. 
And, and it's worth saying that for the National Trust that this country has, you know, it meant a sustained level of engagement from their visitors, which ultimately translated into a greater spend per head in the shop and in the tea room and in the cafe. So those kind of marginal financial gains were a really, really significant outcome alongside those kind of more, if you like, intangible benefits, those qualitative benefits of a richer, uh, more engaging experience. Um, how do you feel, just taking it a bit broader, um, when we talk about uh, impact that science can yeah. have from the humanities or the social sciences compared to other types of disciplines who you might say have more experience or, or more direct uh, pathways to, to impact, yeah. how do you feel that um, business, especially, you know, uh, uh, impact through business development, uh, how it's different for them. What is different for humanities, for social sciences, or maybe what's actually the same? I mean, maybe we should find shared approaches in that as well, because it can't all be completely different. Mm. I think that one of our big challenges when engaging new, new partners <clears throat> is the extent to which those partners require kind of solutions-led or, or, or outcomes-led results, especially if that is an organization that is driven very much by, you know, commercial, you know, performance indicators. You know, they need an answer to a question within a set period of time, and they hopefully need it to, you know, support either a business case or, you know, support the bottom line. Now, at times, that can be a really tricky sell into humanities researchers because, you know, after all, we exist to complicate things, to nuance things, to, um, you know, look at things in different ways. And so for organizations that, that, that actually just want a straight answer to a question, that can be really irritating. So that, I think, is where the role of the sort of broker or the intermediary becomes incredibly important because... I think that helps, that can help frame the conversation. So in our work with external partners from, you know, from, from Oxford's perspective, we will have some relationships that I guess are a bit more, one might see them more as transactional or, or consultancy based, you know, client X has a problem and we need to find a solution to it. Great. Then there are other clients who come to us that, that I guess, want to kind of unpack and open up questions and maybe are aware that that could help influence their strategic direction in the long term, but that it may not have immediate short term, you know, tangible economic benefits. And I think holding the, the challenge for the broker or the intermediaries of people in our kind of roles is, you know, how do you hold those two things in, in, in tension? And how can often short term projects, you know, build confidence in working with that partner that then gets you to the kind of area where humanities academics feel more confident and more, uh, you know, more content, which is that, you know, ripping it all up, throwing it up in the air and saying, hang on, this makes no sense. And, you know, rebuilding from 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 the ground up. So I, I think that 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 tension is implicit in all of the work that we do. And there are some organizations that understand that really early on. And that's part of the reason why they're coming to a university. Um, because they could always just go to a, you know, a freelance consultant to get some of this work done. So there are institutions and organizations that make a conscious choice to work with universities because they want something slightly different and perhaps are not completely outcome obsessed you know for them it's maybe more about the process so i think certainly when it comes to humanities engagement with business i think the process is just as significant as the outcome and i do think that's one of the real strengths and real skills that humanities and ss you know de you know and social science scholars can bring is that process of thinking through and about a problem and maybe thinking with colleagues from outside can help sort of produce that answer or that insight.
you know, the, the researchers that might be watching now, they have these brilliant ideas and wonderful research and outcomes that might actually, you know, be something that can be utilized uh, for the market or for, business, for other situations. Um, just talking to, let's say, you know, if you meet someone like that in a bar when it's possible again, and you say, okay, Oliver, where do I start? What, what, what do I do? Like, I don't even want to go into that snake. Like, what do I do? What, what, what would you tell them? What do they have to do? Or, you know, how do, would you motivate them? And, and, and what would their first steps have to be? It's a great question. And I think uh, for me, it comes down to people. It's about building a professional network, reaching out to people that are, you know, maybe doing some work in that area that you yourself are interested in and sort of finding that common ground. So I guess, I, I, you know, tip number one is, you know, make sure that LinkedIn profile is up to date because that's really helpful. So make sure you've got a really, you know, uh, an online presence that is working for you. Because if people can't find you on Google, they don't care. You know, I mean, I hate to be brutal, but that's the reality, you know, but that's the reality. You know, having a having an online presence gives you credibility. It gives you, it, it gives a shop window for other people to try and understand a little bit about, or a little bit, you know, what, what you're about. So I suppose step one for me is, you know, make sure you've got that kind of online visibility sorted. And I'm not saying build an enormous website for yourself or anything like that, you know, just, just those existing tools and platforms that we have at our disposal like LinkedIn are, are really you know valuable they just give a snapshot as to who you are secondly I would look for I try and look for you know shared connections or shared areas of interest and so you know a good bit of time spent online looking for individuals or organizations that do the kinds of things that you're interested in that you'd like to, you know, you know, develop a conversation with. And having done that, you know, I'd suggest, you know, write to people, drop them an email, you know, ask them a couple of questions, ask if you can meet for, you know, half an hour on a Zoom call or a Skype call. You know, all of this is much easier now. We've got so used to working remotely and working through video calls. So if you like the, the kind of barriers to entry, the awkwardness of meeting someone in a coffee shop for the first time has kind of diminished slightly. You know, the kind of risks inherent in taking a Zoom call are, 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 that, much, are that much less than perhaps making the investment to travel into the, you know, travel into central London, you know, to find a mutually, you know, suitable venue to meet. All of that kind of stuff has been, has been removed. So I think, you know, people are really important in this. And then, Within a university context, I'd, I'd really look towards your careers service or your alumni networks, because in that there are shared experiences and, and shared connections. And just having that, that slight Venn diagram of overlap can enable you to start to build a relationship with, with individuals or organizations that might be slightly outside of your, your comfort zone. So I think it's, it's starting with the people. The second bit of advice I'd give is that, you know, take it slowly. You know, relationships and ideas take time to germinate. They take time to develop. So if after that initial meeting, you haven't already got a, you know, a fully signed up and agreed partnership and away you go, don't worry because it takes time to build trust and it takes time to work through where those areas of mutual benefit might be. Now, of course, this is a this is a problem if at that moment that you're looking to do this, you don't have a salaried position. You know, if you're, you know, if by that point you've ended, you know, your PhD is finished. You know, you're, you know, you're not bringing in much money. That can be really, can be really, really difficult. So my suggestion in those examples is to look for kind of parallel or, or, or academic related either freelance or short-term opportunities that can just help bring a bit of cash in you know so just make sure that there's a bit of money to 
uh, to live on that gives a platform and you know enables you to spend the time to cultivate relationships in those in those other areas that you might look to work in and with I think my my third area my third suggestion and this is something that I have often signally failed at is being good with numbers or at least understanding how a budget sheet works um, which I think is really significant, especially if one is heading out into a more commercial context, you know, where, you know, where it is important to make sure that you deliver within budgets, you know, that money might be tight and, and you know, and, is, and, and so being aware of the ways in which, you know, you can manage either your own budget streams or have experience of managing money within a, you know, within either an institutional or a project context, I think is really beneficial. So these would be my sort of three key areas to start with. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And even if you're so terrible with numbers, I guess there's always colleagues or people or even, I mean, I know of, of, a, of an old colleague of mine who just had his sister do all the paperwork. I'm not yeah. saying everyone should, but I mean, it, it's not rocket science uh, to start with, but it's, 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 useful to understand and, and to have insight yeah. to that. I, I agree. So Oliver, I was wondering, in this current time, obviously we can't ignore it. Uh, that brings a lot of change, uh, uh, the, the pandemic and the effects it has on everything we have to do online uh, and the risks that we take. What's the role of, of humanities and the impact they can have at the moment? Um, how has it changed that? Has it affected that? Um, and uh, yeah, how how's maybe even your own work? How's it changed because of that? So in my in my own work, in the work that my 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 team has been doing over the last year since we were since we were locked down, it's almost a year to the day since we were since we were locked down in the UK. Um, the, there have been two you know two major impacts. The first has been the catastrophic economic impact on our partners in the heritage and cultural sector. Uh, for much of the year, indeed, in almost all of the year, they've been closed to the public. So there has been very, very little visitor income at all. Uh, so, the, the, so they are in a level of sort of commercial and financial precarity that we really haven't seen since the end of the Second World War. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really bad in terms of organizations' finances. The second aspect uh, was the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent reigniting of the, the Black Lives Matter movement has had and will continue to have really severe sort of shockwaves ricocheting out throughout the cultural sector, which in, in the UK, at least is is really encouraging and you know enabling organizations to think about the kinds of histories that they tell and to confront head on the kind of imperial amnesia that characterizes contemporary British history. You know, it's this idea that we were, you know, we had Henry VIII and Winston Churchill and everything was fine. And we can't remember what happened in the 18th century. Did we have an empire? If we did, it was probably good and we could never have done anything bad. So one of the big roles that I think humanities research will have to play in the next couple of years is really combating this idea that there's a balance sheet to history that we're weighing up good and bad and that some things are better than others. I think my, my firm belief as to how we will get through and create a more equitable you know, national story is to accept that it is incredibly complicated. The empire is, you know, is neither, you know, is neat, well, the, you know, the, 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 the the, the way in which Britain has been entwined with its empire and then seems to have forgotten its empire in the way in which we teach history in schools will have to change. So I think there's a huge opportunity for humanity scholars there in terms of surfacing and sharing these uh, often overlooked stories. Um, so we've been working closely with organizations who may not have the research skills to do that, to help, you know, to, to help generate projects around that. Um, I think that the, the third aspect that's been really striking about the lockdown 
and the amount of time that we've all spent sitting on our sofas watching Netflix is the extent to which our lives are governed by and, you know, uh, entertained through content, you know, online content, you know, be it YouTube videos, be it the latest Netflix series. I think a lot of those, you know, almost all of them have roots in kind of humanities disciplines. So I think for humanities researchers, the next 10 years, <clears throat> I think, will be characterized by a much closer engagement with uh, film, television, content creators and content producers of all sorts of different, um, you know, different stripes and, and, and scales from podcast through to, you know, Bridgerton. These things are powered by humanities insights. And so I think for humanities researchers now, the real opportunity is, you know, how do you market your knowledge and skills in a way that seems appealing and enticing to those, um, you know, to those, those companies, those individuals, those SMEs, those micro businesses uh, creating great content. So for me, that's where the opportunity lies. And in doing that, we can also foreground those kinds of narratives, particularly, um, you know, around uh, the Black experience within the UK, which is often overlooked. You know, there's ways in which humanities researchers can bring those kind of stories to the, 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 the you know, the, the foreground. So in the broad sense, we're talking about the value that science has, any science um, uh, for society and how we can make sure that this uh, value is actually being used, uh, that, that science is being utilized, that impact is being had. Um, what is, if you'd have to choose one thing, the most important thing that we need to focus on to be sure that we stimulate and optimize the impact of science on society. Ooh, that is the million, a million euro question. Um, this world peace. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is to, <clears throat> within a university context, it is to enable and build the capacity and skills of researchers to feel like they can make that contribution. So an awareness of the kind of skills and partnerships that they could create. So there's an awareness piece on the one hand for researchers. And then I think secondly, there's an investment piece, which is in the, and I would say this, because this is exactly the kind of role that I occupy, in that brokering, that networking, that project management that enables researchers, individual researchers to feel part of a team and felt part of something bigger. Um, so coming right back to my first point around sort of mutual benefit and shared values, you know, I think that is the really exciting, you know, potential and possibility is to encourage and broaden the horizons of individual researchers on the one hand, but ensure that when those horizons are expanded and there's an opportunity or they feel like there's an opportunity, that there is a support and collaborative network that sits around them to enable that work to happen. So I think it's, yeah, those are my two, my two top tips, I guess. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ali. I really appreciate it. Um, well, I mean, this interview now um, is uh, done. Thank you so much for, for being here and for uh, participating in it. Um, of course, our collaboration is far from over. We have uh, a few months, uh, upcoming months, where we're going to be collaborating a lot still on uh, uh, the course and the workshop that we're organizing. So in May, unfortunately not in Oxford as we would usually do, um, but we will be uh, working together on the Business Development for Social Sciences and Humanities course and the workshop for PhDs and early career researchers uh, in general on innovation and entrepreneurship of science. So um, I'm really grateful. I, I would actually name the dates if I knew by heart, but <laughs> I'm certain that my colleagues will put a link below um, in which they can, uh, or maybe here, 
or here. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, they, uh, they, I'm sure they, they, they're much better at that than I am. Um, but uh, I'm looking very much looking forward to working with you on that. I hope people who are watching have enjoyed this and uh, uh, have seen this already as sort of an introduction to what we're offering in May. And, uh, um, and maybe we'll see uh, everyone there. For now, uh, Ali, thank you again. And uh, sure. we'll talk soon. Thank you for all your input. Brilliant. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.